No? OK, good. So I spend a lot of time on Twitter. Um, if you want to hang out, that's where to go hang out and find me if you want to talk games or, or, or computer security or software or beer. Um, my roles in this world, I am a husband. My wife, Gabrielle, is in the back probably feeding our daughter, which leads to the whole father thing. Um, fatherhood plays a big role in this talk, so we'll talk more about that later. Um, actually, professionally, I am an author. I've, I've written around 16 technical books, um, or written on 16 technical books, mostly about Microsoft.net technologies. Um, I am a software composer. Um, that term comes from um, a book uh, called Lauren Ipsum, uh, a children's book about computer science I strongly recommend everybody read. It, in 138 pages, taught me more about computer science than a bachelor's degree in 20 years in the industry did. Um, and one of the things that they taught was that, that, that um, solving problems is a lot like composing music. And it really is, having done both professionally, I can say that there's a tremendous mesh and now whenever I put Software Composer on my resume just to screw up the, the resume mills and stuff, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I am a home brewer. Uh, I did not bring any beer to this con. I probably should have. I am also a lock picker. You'll probably find me sitting in the uh, Lockpick Village opening things. Uh, I am the um, administrative director of Locksport International. I'll be giving a talk uh, about what Locksport has taught me about security uh, tomorrow um, at 5 also. I am actually a ninja. Uh, I study in 5th Q. I mean, like, really a ninja. Like, I have a belt, ninja. Um, and I'm also something of an insurrectionist. I have a really bad habit of saying the kind of the wrong thing at the wrong time and getting in trouble for it. So, But none of that matters, actually, because what we're talking about today is totally unlike anything else that, that I normally talk about. And what we're talking about is how, the story of how I wrote a miniatures game from scratch so that my son could play miniatures games with me. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So if you thought we were talking about computer security or lock picking, um, that would be a different con <laughs> for me anyway. So my credentials. Um, I, you mostly know my credentials in security and lock picking, but um, how about gaming? Well, this was my gaming posse in 1985. I'm the one with the glasses in the front sitting cross-legged. I can no longer sit cross-legged, by the way, so that's where that's worth. Uh, I have been gaming for a very long time. In fact, here is where I started. Um, I was very upset when the second edition came out. I'm actually still a little bitter. Um, I remember when people went to this, and I was not interested. In fact, I dissed it totally. It was, it was, it, as, and it's just totally, it's too mainstream. Not, not, not for me. I'm going to play the real games. Yeah, anyway. And then, of course, all my friends who played, they all have alpha decks now, and they're selling their black lotuses for $1,000 at Origin. So who, <laughs> who's, who's laughing now? I've got to stop hitting this thing. I'm going to break it. So um, I talked about fatherhood. Kaylin's in the back of the room. This is her. Uh, she's a little too young to be gaming. She mostly eats Legos. Um, this one, however, is already quite a gamer, and he's up there setting up our gaming board now and doing an excellent job of it, by the way, Adam. Um, and he... Um, really enjoys gaming. And part of the reason he, part, part, I mean, Gabrielle and I are big, big gamers. And so we would go to conferences and do things, and he would really want to participate. And we learned that, um, that games and children mix much better than even like contemporary education and, and social theory would have you believe. Um, the, the kids learn to take turns in games. And even if you're just playing Candyland with a three-year-old, the concept of it's my turn now, it's your turn next, that has to be taught. That's not natural. What's natural is me, me, me. But teaching, da, 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 that, that's an important lesson to be learned. Um, you also learn to make decisions in gaming, which is something else that isn't natural. Children are kind of brought up, especially in the United States, to, to do what they're told, not to look at a scenario and go, what would be best here? Um, and what they do is, is it, it, what games do is put them in a position where they have to without any help, look at a situation and go, what's the best thing to do? Not the right thing, the best thing. Very different, extremely hard for you know, somebody under the age of eight or, or, or so. Um, and also, really, and very importantly, especially for this one, we learn to win and lose. Um, losing is not fun for anybody, but it's part of life, and we have to learn how to deal with it, and also how to win gracefully, which sometimes is hard. So th those lessons are very good. And things go well together for kids and games until they don't. There are some problems that I've discovered, especially trying to 
move forward as Adam ages. Uh, the first problem is 900 page rule books, which are <laughs> extraordinarily prevalent in the kind of games that, that I'm, I'm most used to. Um, there's of course the whole small parts issue where, where you know, this, uh, don't, don't play with this if you're under the age of three, but I think we're largely past that at this stage of the game. The biggest problem is the running with scissors issue. Uh, the large amounts of, of logic is not the kind of thing that your average six-year-old is going to be able to parse well. They're going to get frustrated very quickly and quit. So if you look at this, th these games, we, we find out that we have this massive gap between the kinds of games that are appropriate for, say, four-year-olds and then the kinds of games that are appropriate for 12-year-olds. And I found that that gap is remarkably huge. What I decided I wanted to do was write a bridge, some kind of bridge game that I could use. Like this has been done in programming languages over and over and over again. People have written these small, um, intricate but not overly sophisticated languages to teach children programming. I mean, we used uh, used Visual Basic or Basic, not Visual Basic, Basic when I was young, and now there are much better examples going forward. I wanted to do the same thing for games. So what I decided to do was write a simplified version of Warhammer. Now, does anybody here know what Warhammer is? Okay, so I've got a couple people. For the rest of you, let me tell you what Warhammer is. Warhammer is a miniatures game. Okay, It is played on a table with actual miniatures that can be customized, painted, collected, whatever, and then a set army list. And that army list is designated by points. So in order for your character to cast this spell, it's going to cost you 30 points. That spell will cost you 40. And then the two sides, or however many sides there are, agree on how many points their army is going to have at the start of the game. Uh, that makes sure that we have a relatively even battle. The only thing that should separate the two is tactics. Of course, that all depends on the game design. If the game is designed right, that works. If the game is designed wrong, it doesn't, which is why many miniatures games have fallen flat. Warhammer was written very well. And it succeeded. The reason it has worked well is because it is impossibly complicated. The rule books are like this big if you stack them together. I can't play it without help. And I'm not kidding. I mean, the two people that I normally play Warhammer with are both have an IQ of about 160. They have the rules freaking memorized. And I go, all right, so I want to move my dwarves over there. How do I do that again? And like, yeah, you have to sort this and roll over. OK, that's fine. Page 97 of the rule book. Oh, OK, I'll do that. So that's Warhammer. Uh, also, Warhammer has the additional problem, of course, most people love this, problem of being long and ugly. Warhammer takes about three hours to play. And it's played in these huge steaming halls with a bunch of middle-aged guys that haven't showered recently and for hours and hours on end, and they love it. Um, we go to a gaming conference in Ohio. Well, and I am in Ohio. Boy, I've traveled too much recently. <laughs> We go to a gaming conference in Columbus called Origins. Um, if you have not been there, I strongly recommend you go. It is amazing. 14,000 of your best friends playing everything from vampire LARPs to poker. Seriously, it's, it's astounding. The Columbus Convention Center is completely taken over, and one whole hall is miniatures game. And that's pretty much what it looks like, except bigger. So how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm doing great. Oh, no, that's the time. OK, I'm still doing great. So my strategy. OK, I thought that the principles of Warhammer, OK, miniatures game played on a tabletop with points, more or less, could be used to produce a totally new game with much less in the way of strategy uh, and much less in the way of tactics that um, would be achievable for a, for a young child. Hey, Adam, I, you've, been, you've been doing stuff for a long time. OK, is everything all right? OK. <laughs> Just want to make sure you're not setting out every miniature we have. <laughs> so. Here was my strategy. My, my first strategy is I diluted points to dice. So instead of building a unit of Warhammer miniatures where if this power is this many points, this power, so this, this unit is 392 points and this unit is 286 points, we are going to instead just decide that a unit is a certain number of dice. So at the base level, a unit of 10 archers will be 10 dice. OK? Up and down, that's what it comes down to. Um, I decided we would have exactly two classes of characters. Anybody who's a, any kind of gamer probably recognizes that term. Are you a spellcaster? Are you a thief? Are you a, are you a warrior? Are you, what, what are you? I have two classes in this game. I have not told you what the name of the game is yet. I realized that when I went through the slides, I forgot to fix it. We named the game Torna. So if I eventually say Torna, you'll know what it is. That's the name of the game or the working name. 
So I have two classes. I have shooters and I have melee, and that's it. Okay? It doesn't matter whether you have a missile launcher or a bow and arrow or a sling or a rock you're throwing, you're a shooter. And if you have a sword or your fists or a big club or a jackhammer, you're melee. Doesn't matter. Um, and then movement, I then restricted to mounted and, and on foot. And that's it. Okay, Adam. Okay, just calm down, take a seat or something. <laughs> mounted and on foot. So you either can, you can either uh, walk more or less or do whatever you do with, with normal locomotion, or you can ride something, a horse, a tank, I don't care. There's two categories. So as it turns out, it all worked pretty well. Strangely enough, it all worked pretty well. Let me, let, here, let me tell you a little bit of the details of how, how it all worked together. So it all came down basically to miniatures, dice, and distance. The miniatures are kind of the draw for a kid because, as you can see, he's been over here futzing with them steadily for 15 minutes since we started. Um, they are fun, interesting, collectible, not exactly cheap, but you can find them with reasonable cost. You can paint them yourselves. You can add things to them. You can use existing stuff. Because Torna is so loose and we have so few uh, character roles, you can, have, you can use your Legos, you can use your army man, you can use anything you want. Any toy that can be stood and serviceably moved as a unit can, can be played with as part of a Torna game. As long as you can fit it into one of the classes and you decide ahead of time what it is, you're set to go. Then the other side of the piece is dice and distance. <clears throat> dice and distance basically play the, the core of the game. You use a tape measure to move your units. So you're learning distance and you're learning spatial integrity. And then you use the dice to do things like uh, conduct warfare. Um, so you get to learn mathematics and probability and all those wonderful things you deal with. So we get the math in and the life skills in with the draw being the miniatures. I've learned this is kind of an important part of building a toy or, or any kind of educational system for young people. It's, it's, you've got to have the hook and then you've got to have the payoff. And the hook is the miniatures, and the payoff is the mathematics and general life skills that you learn. So set up a game. Well, Adam's been setting up a game for a while here. <clears throat> and um, you can see that there's, there's really two things, uh, that, one of which he's doing invisibly and one of which he's doing obviously. The first thing you need to do is build a playing surface. Well, we'll yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> um, the, playing, the nice thing about Torna, or any miniatures game really, but, but Torna especially, is that it can be played on any flat surface. Any table is fine. Um, this is much narrower over table. We usually use our kitchen table, which is monstrous. Um, and he can't even reach across. This might be a better table for him. Um, be less crazy, please. Thank you. Um, and um, so you need, to, you need to set up a playing surface. And then you need to size the army. Just like with Warhammer, where you're going to decide how many points you have on either side. In Torna, you decide how many dice you have on either side. Now, Adam, how many dice do we have on either side of that army? Did you count? Seven. Seven. Five. Six. And seven. Seven. Seven? Oh, okay. Okay, don't worry about him. Sorry. So. We'll, we'll, we'll play a little bit, and you get to come over here, and I'll count up to make sure everything's right. But these, he has units set up here. For instance, here is a unit of, um, of uh, mounted knights, and there's six here. So that could be six dice, or if one of them is as a captain, he might be a two-dice player. Okay? So when he attacks, he gets two dice to attack with. And then when he defends, he has two dice worth of life to lose. All right? So this unit could be worth seven points, or it could be worth six. We have to decide in advance and write it down. Or, or make some kind of notation so that our two sides are equal. So that's, that is the, um, that's the other half of the setup that's kind of been happening invisibly here. Now, admittedly, that is not the easiest of concepts. And <clears throat> um, I will have to go back over this before we play and make sure that it was added up correctly because it's not easy. But you'll see a little bit later on, when we play at home, we actually write down an army list. And that makes, that's another bit of that educational piece that, that makes things really interesting. So Torna, like Warhammer, is a turn-based game. You go first um, and manipulate all your units, and then your opponent goes and manipulates all of their units. Um, when one of us has no units left, the other one has won. That is the basic flow of the game. Um, like I said, there's no game board. You play on a tabletop with whatever things you want. The movement is all conducted with a tape measure. So you know how far your units can move, and you just point them in the direction they want to go, you get one free re reconfiguration per turn, and then you move them their set movement for their character class. 
archers, well, I'm sorry, shooters in general, get to move two inches. They have a shorter move to balance out the fact that they can put damage anywhere on the board. Um, people on foot can move four inches, and anything mounted can move eight inches. Um, units, like I said, units are allowed one free formation per turn, so you can change your line or, um, or, or, or rotate once, once per turn for free. Uh, and, and that just fits into the system. But you cannot split, and you, can, you cannot split units, but you can merge them. Okay, that's been an interesting little twist to the rules that we've needed to do. Uh, another piece that's interesting, we'll talk about actually in melee, so hang on for a second. So, um, yes, units can stay together. <clears throat> the units have to stay together. They can merge, but not split. I said that already. Um, so that's movement. Let's talk about battle. So there's two kinds of battle I said earlier. There's shooting and there's melee. So, like I said, arrows, missiles, don't care, it's all the same. It's going to work exactly the same way. So, more or less, here's the way it works. <clears throat> if you have a melee going on here, um, what we have in this picture is a set of unpainted knights, for, for ease of clarity, a set of unpainted knights and a set of painted knights, and they're fighting each other. <clears throat> so, when the person whose turn it is to attack, they count up the number of dice in their unit. So, if we say, for instance, that this dude here is a captain, and these two guys are regular, regular guys, then that's a four die unit. So we would pick up four dice, four six sided dice, and roll them. Because they're melee, six sided, or, um, because they're melee units, they get a roll to hit of three or more. All right, so if they roll a three, four, five, or six, they have hit. Then you pick up all the dice that has hit, and you roll it again. And that's rolling for damage. Damage is four or more for melee units. So four, five, or six damages. Every damage you do takes a die away from the opposing unit. So this unit has four people in it. Okay, all of them are normal, so it's four dice. <clears throat> so if I were to roll and do three hits and then roll again and do two damage, they would take two dice for some damage in that unit. Because the way that unit is structured, that means two of the men are dead. They'd be removed from the table. Does that make sense? So I've taken probably about 90 pages of the Warhammer rulebook and condensed it to that. But it works. Shooting is very similar, okay? It's the, 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 the <clears throat> dice of the units are the same. So, oh, I'm sorry. So we have these archers over here, right? So there's six archers there. So they have six dice worth of archers. The only difference is because shooters can land damage anywhere on the field, they don't have to move to go get it. It's a little harder to hit and a little harder to damage. So when they roll, they, two, they hit on a four or more and damage on a five or more to balance the game. Um, <clears throat> there's also an interesting tidbit that we've... Uh, a couple of interesting uh, additional rules we've added on, and we'll talk about adding on rules as we go. Uh, in melee, we added on the concept of charge. Normally, you can't move and shoot in the same turn. I think I said that before. Normally, you can't move and shoot in the same turn. But in uh, this, uh, in, in, in the case of uh, melee troops, if they move into the unit, they can attack that turn. So if you're mounted, for instance, and the unit you're attacking is within eight inches, you can move and hit at the same turn. So that's an added rule that we, uh, that we put in to balance a little bit more towards the melee guys, because honestly, the melee guys were all getting killed by the shooters before they get into the play. Uh, then shooting, what we did is we started to introduce terrain, okay? We would put stuff, non-player character stuff, on the, on the field of play um, in order to block shooters. Once again, to try to reduce the power of shooters, because even further, because they were still massacring everybody. So now you have to have line of sight. So you actually have to get down. And if your characters, if your unit can't see the unit you're shooting at, even partially obscured, you can't shoot them. Oh, sorry. I'm not used to my new controller, so you're going to have to give me a break here. Then things get fun. Because now that we have a basic rule set, we can pretty much do whatever we want. You want to do some neat machines? No problem. OK, that's probably a little big. But you get the idea, right? You can put anything on the table and call it a player. At least you're entertaining them. <clears throat> you want to do something with terrain? You want to build your own? You want to use Legos? Do we have the Legos out, Adam? Yeah, OK. Um, did you make it a tank, or is it actually a building or something? A bridge, OK. So we got a bridge. You want to make a bridge? You, want to, you could go all out. You could, go, you could model if you wanted to. You could make a river and do a whole permanent setting to play, uh, which Warhammer players and miniatures players in general do regularly. You can pretty much do whatever you want. Anything you want to set on the board, you can call a character, assign dice to it, and you know exactly what it can do, how far it can move, and how well it can shoot. So the only thing that I'd say is that agree on the rules beforehand. Like for, in our games, tanks are always four dice. If we put something on the thing and say, oh, this is a tank, that's four dice in one unit. 
which is or one, one physical like move by itself thing. So that's neat because you get to roll four dice at once. That's a lot of damage in one shot. Ta -da -ta -da -ta -da. But that's a lot. That's a lot of your army tied up in one thing. So there's some balance at play there. So the end game. I mentioned before the game ends when one player runs out of pieces. When you've killed all of your opponent's units, uh, all the pieces are gone out of every unit. All the players are gone out of every unit. The game is over, and you have won. So, Bill, how did it work out? Well, actually, it's worked out awesomely. Would you say it's fun? Do you like to play Torna? Yes, you do. Um, you're kind of wondering why we're not playing right now. <clears throat> I spent more time teaching good gaming habits than I spent teaching the game. That's an honest statement. He picked up the rules of the game a year ago. He's six now. I taught him when he was five. He picked up the rules of the game in about a half hour. I'm still teaching him good gaming habits. Um, he's, he's real good, though. Um, rolling the dice neatly, the basics of tactics, good sportsmanship, uh, are the kinds of things that actually become more of a lesson than the rules themselves. <clears throat> you need to be a stickler for the rules. Um, the, the, for instance, point of view, you know, for cover, it's not like you're actually out there with a paintball gun, and if they can't see you, they can't shoot you because you're behind something. There's argument. Well, I can sort of see that character. No, Adam, if you can't see, if, if, they're, if, they're, if it's blocked in any way, you can't shoot them. That's it. But it's, it's subjective, so you get that kind of conversation. So that's good. And then the biggest deal is enforcing not changing the rules midstream. Because it's, well, actually, you know, he, he gets to put the train down, and he goes, well, actually, I want these trees over there. Adam, we're three turns into the game. The trees didn't just get up and move. Well, but I really want them over there. I know. But we don't change the rules in the middle of the game. Another uh, good one is the, uh, actually, he's a captain now. They promoted him. So he's two dice. Okay, we can't do that in the middle of the game. You don't do that. No. So what was the aftermath? Um, basically, uh, the, 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 as far as the, the game is concerned, after a long game, losing kind of stinks. So he wants to play bigger and bigger games with more and more miniatures and goes against Legos and Army Men and all this different stuff out. We end up with like a 90-point game, and it runs for an hour. And then he loses. And after you've played something for an hour, you've put that much of your time into, losing is not the best thing ever. And for the record, I do not always win. He regularly wins the game. There is enough just blind luck in the game that even if I actually try to do some tactical things, he, he will still beat me occasionally, uh, actually about half the time. Um, so what you do is you keep it moving. I, I, I take distractions. We actually clear the table before we start to play things like that. Those kinds of things make a big difference when you're playing a game with a young person. Um, uh, you you um, also need to clean up the game board as you go. So when, play, when, characters, when characters in the game die or whatever, make sure you take them off the board. Less things to fiddle with while you're doing your turn makes life a lot easier. So what have I learned out of all of this? I've learned some really pretty interesting things about the psychology of, uh, of six-year-olds that I didn't know before, and I wish I kind of, I probably should sit and buy a psychologist some beer and learn more. The capacity for learning is significantly greater than I thought. Um, we, we had played two games, and he wanted to enhance the rules. Uh, he, we, added, we added two dice captains in the next game. He, he had no problems with terrain conceptually. He knew he had to plot his movements around things that if he had a, a unit of knights, the knights couldn't spread out through the trees. It doesn't work that way with a horse. All those things he had zero problems with. Um, I, I, was, I, I know he's a smart kid, but I was very surprised by that. Um, reading is often the biggest barrier to game adoption, frankly. And one of the huge benefits of Torn is there's really no reading. As long as the adult knows the rules, the child doesn't have to do anything. In D&D, you have to be able to read. Um, Magic, even, which is a relatively simple game to play, it's, it's constant reading and big words, too, on those cards. The rules are written right on the card if you don't know the game. If you can't read, you can't play. So even simple card-based games, collectible card-based games, can't be played by, by kids who, who aren't strong readers. Now, as it turns out, he's a very prolific reader, largely because of his mother. Um, actually, entirely because of his mother. And um, he, uh, he, could, he could play a game that involves reading and regularly does. He plays games on the Xbox that involve a lot of reading and has no problems with it. But the neat thing about building a game like this is it doesn't require any specialized reading skills. Ugh, wrong button again. All right. And the other thing that I learned is sufficiently interesting games will involve a young kid for a much longer time than I thought. Um, he can get distracted in 30 seconds. Trust me. I mean, he, he, keeping his attention is very difficult. But if it's his miniatures that he painted and he cares about, he cares about the characters that are represented by those miniatures, he'll play for now. Seriously, play for now. It's pretty neat.
So where do I go from here? Well, let me tell you. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm uh, basically what, what this what this all started out is just something to play with him. Um, just and I was just sketching rules in the back of a napkin. Basically, I ended up writing up a huge blog post for it, and there was a lot of uh, a lot of comments, a lot of interest uh, that I got fed feedback from email and blog comments and and and, uh, and Twitter. And I thought, you know, I really should write this into a presentation and give it someplace. And where better than not a con? I mean, it's this is the kind of thing. This is hacking a game, right? Let's let's talk about it. Um, <clears throat> so w what I'd like to do is actually build up a rule sheet for it and post it up on on, on my blog so that people can download it and play it and try it. Um, but I want to rev the rules first. I want to add a couple of things um, that are optional so that you can play it in this simple version that we play here, or you can add a couple of things. I'd like to add some different kinds of units, maybe. I don't know exactly what I want. Probably magic users um, and, and provide a simple magic system. I'll talk about that in a little bit, too, or at least mention it. Um, something that Adam has been asking for, and actually he asked for without any input from me at all and has been repeating the need for, is loyalty and fleeing. Um, if you've played any miniatures games before, you know that, um, that, that, especially if you're dealing with more spurious characters like orcs and goblins, for instance, in the Warhammer world, um, they will run away. <laughs> if they feel they're being beaten, you have to roll a loyalty check and they will run. Well, Adam wants to run away. And one of the kind of table rules that we have is that once you're engaged in battle, you can't disengage from battle. The battle continues until one side wins. Um, which is, a, a, it, it's not actually part of the rules of the game, but I would strongly recommend it for anybody. But I also want to say that the, the you may we may either require a loyalty check if you've lost more than half your units, for instance, or half your characters in your unit, or we may um, allow you to roll for uh, retreat if you so choose, and then reform. Because there is some tactical benefit to that. If your unit has lost half its characters and this unit has lost half its characters, and you would like them to fall back and reform into a larger unit, then there's some tactical benefit to that. So that, that's something I was considering doing, but I'm not sure how to do easily. So if anybody has any comments, let me know afterwards. Something else I'd also like to add, and he's asked for too, is magic and technology. Um, it would be really good to be able to put a character, like we have magic user characters in the miniatures, but they don't actually do any magic. We just call them shooters and pretend like they shoot fireballs or whatever, and that's their shooting. But it would be interesting to be able to have some kind of magic that... that is enforceable in the dice based system. And I don't know, I don't know how we're gonna do that yet. So one of the interesting things, Adam is homeschooled, um, and um, we have a really good time with that. Um, we, we, we don't homeschool for any particular reason aside from the fact that we like to travel and do neat stuff. And th it's really tough to do that if you have to stick to a school schedule. Um, and then sometimes he likes to sit on the floor. What do you have in your mouth? Oh, don't do that. Um, so because of that, uh, we're constantly surrounded with educational stuff. Um, uh, we, we, there's a site called Brain Pop Junior that's a hundred, this big educational site with all these flash movies and activities and stuff, and he just sits and watches it for fun. Okay, so it's, it's a constant, constant theme in our house. There's always the curriculum laying around and worksheets to be done, even on Saturday morning, he'll get up and do a math worksheet or whatever. So the educational pieces are a big part of this, and one of the first educational things that I've gotten out of this is Honestly, just handling the dice sounds ridiculous, but it was amazing watching him pick up ten. Because if you have a unit with ten, uh, unit with ten characters, and you pick up ten dice, you roll them all, and it's like, okay, all the dice that are three, four, five, and six, pick them up and roll them again to see who did damage. And watching him struggle with that initially, and now just go like this and pick it up. I don't know what synapse connected up here. But something was learned there that is translating into, into handling small numbers very quickly and efficiently. Like that, those people who can look at, uh, look at numbers and quickly figure out what 15% of it is, do that kind of estimation, that synapse, which didn't connect for me, well, actually, it really still hasn't connected for me, but that's neither here nor there. It, that's already connected for him. He's already making those kind of quick judgments about numbers. Um, writing the army list is a significant piece of this. He does not like to write. He does like to compose text if he gets to type it, but writing an army list is not his favorite thing in the whole world. And we will write army lists. This is one of your army lists, right, Adam? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, th yes, 30 archers. And, well, actually, 35, I think, archers. There's another little five down there. But you'll notice he didn't write archer four times for the four units of archers because that would be a lot of writing. But one of the interesting things is we have a first grader who has absolutely no fear of adding a column of nine numbers. He does it all the time. 
And that's, I've, turned, I've learned, is not exactly normal. But I'm really glad to see it. Because it's a skill he's picked up from gaming. Not just this, we also play Bakugan, which has a lot of having to add stacks of numbers to add, add up your power-ups. Um, but between those two games, we, uh, we, we, have, we have got this. Um, <clears throat> and then, honestly, tactics. Which sounds like a ridiculous thing for a, uh, for a kid to, uh, a six-year-old, need to learn. But it actually isn't because it applies to what I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk to kind of come around full circle. Looking at a situation and figuring out the best possible answer is not something that, is not something that just, uh, th th not something that you are born with. It's something you have to learn how to do. And playing games, especially a tactic heavy game like this one, makes a lot of that happen. So it has been, um, it has been a, uh, a, a really strong educational market for us. So um, if, if, if you'd like, he has set up a game over here, and anyone who's interested can come up and we'll play around after I relevel our characters, and you guys can watch um, if you wish. Or if, you're, if you've learned what you want to learn and you want to go get a beer, knock yourself out, that's fine too. We'll just come, we'll play a quick round, and then we'll be done. Um, so let's, let's count here, Adam. Let's, um, all right, so... I see what you've done here, okay. Captains. Okay. Captain. Okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14.